Welcome to the Living Your Greatness podcast. I am your host, Ben Mummy. The purpose of the podcast is to inspire millions of people across the world to achieve greatness and enhance their overall personal well-being. Living Your Greatness is becoming the go-to resource that CEOs, elite athletes, professional coaches, and entrepreneurs rely on to upgrade themselves. The podcast helps you master the best of what other people have already figured out. So I gladly invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy tuning in to today's episode. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Living Your Greatness. This is your host, Ben Mummy, and today we have a new guest to the show, and his name is Josh Linkner. So for those of you that don't know Josh, he started his career as a jazz guitarist. He embraces creativity, entrepreneurship, and disruptive innovation. Josh has been the founder and CEO of five tech companies, which sold for a combined value of over $200 million. Josh is a New York Times bestselling author of four books, Discipline Dreaming, The Road to Reinvention, Hacking Innovation, and his latest title, Big Little Breakthroughs. So Josh, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks so much. Great to be with you. Awesome, Josh. Yeah, I know. I'm super stoked to have you here because you have such a big background of kind of different domains. So Josh, I kind of want to start off, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, where did you spend your formative years growing up? And what inspired you to become a jazz guitarist, a founder and CEO of five tech companies, and then afterwards a two times New York Times bestselling author? Well, thank you. Uh, So I'm from Detroit. I was born in the city of Detroit, not the suburbs. And uh, from a very early age, uh, you know, I kind of grew up in this area where people were making stuff and creating things. And I, I fell in love with music very early. Started playing piano at eight and maybe a year or so later started playing uh, guitar. And of course, like most kids, you know, I wanted to learn Stairway to Heaven so I could get a girl to like me. But uh, I was with a guitar teacher and he's like, hey, if you really want to get good, learn jazz. If you can play jazz, you can play everything. And so when I started peeking under the covers of jazz music, man, I just fell in love. It's this beautiful, dangerous art form and it's expressive. And it's the one art form that's real time. You know, think about a person painting, you, you can go back and make a a correction, but if you're playing jazz, you're, you're performing and composing simultaneously. It's improvisational and it's raw. And I just fell in love. So I started playing gigs very early in my teens. I, I, I put myself through college playing music. And then what happened was um, I've always, always like a little bit of a tech nerd. And at age 20, I decided to start a tech company, but I had no business background. I'd never taken a business class, but truthfully, it was just like, all right, it's like playing jazz. You're going to figure it out. You're going to find a way. And so I've been improvising my way ever since. 30 some years later. And really, it's funny, I don't mean to sound like like a postcard, but I really feel like I still just play jazz every day. And whether that's investing in some tech startup, whether it's writing a book, whether it's uh, giving a keynote or, or helping a company build a culture of innovation. Uh, to me, it's it's really all jazz, just playing different instruments. That's awesome, Josh. I totally agree with you in terms of especially music, right? Like the way that we could feel that sense of creativity and and as well as how you could apply it into everywhere of your life. And I actually feel that as well when it comes to like, for example, you know, I'm, I'm very athletic, right? And so I do a lot of movement and there's so many ways to be creative and kind of get kind of moving with that. So thanks for sharing us like your background of who you are. Something that I'm excited to go about with in this conversation, Josh, is you recently published a book, you know, called The Big Little Breakthroughs. The book clearly summarizes, you know, how small creative acts could unlock massive rewards over time. And so Josh, I'm curious to ask you, like what sparked your motivation to write this book? Well, innovation so often is misunderstood and it feels out of reach. Like it, unless it's a billion dollar idea, it doesn't even count. And and certainly inventing the printing press or penicillin was creative, but that type of bar feels too high for most of us. And what I wanted to do is democratize innovation. It, it shouldn't be some exclusive club for billionaires. It should be for us all. And the truth is that all human beings have, are, we're, we're hardwired to be creative. That's our natural state. Um, and some of us haven't really fully developed those skills, but we certainly have the capacity to do so. And so for me, I went out on this mission. I, I, I wanted to decode this weird, squishy topic of human creativity. How do the most innovative people think and act? What are their mindsets and habits and tactics? How do they approach the work? And what I discovered through over a thousand hours of interviews and research is that it's opposite of what most of us think. You know, most of us think creativity or innovation are these wild, high-risk, swing-for-the-fences moonshots. But the truth is the best innovators cultivate small daily habits, little baby micro innovations. Again, I call them big little breakthroughs. And so it's it's, it's high volume, low risk, little baby innovations. And it actually becomes a much more pragmatic approach. It's it's more accessible to us all. It's less risky. 
and you're building critical skills along the way. You're, you're learning to be creative. So you're more likely to discover the big ones by practicing on the small ones. I love that. And Josh, you know, if we think about creativity, like before we kind of, you know, explore a little bit of your book, you know, how would you actually define creativity to you? And what is like one common myth that, you know, you're trying to debunk right now? I've thought, I've thought a lot about this and of course read, you know, countless academic research and journals and such, but um, to me, creativity is simply the act of, a bad, of, of inventing something or imagining something that doesn't exist. It doesn't have to be useful. It doesn't have to be art or music. It could be anything. Um, it's just sort of, you know, if you have the capacity to imagine something that isn't right in front of you, that's creativity. Innovation is a subset. In other words, innovation, the only difference is that there's something useful. And, and a playful example I wrote in the book is that if I went uh, downstairs and, and painted my wife's car purple, that would be creative by definition because her car is not purple. Now, it would be not useful, quite the opposite. I'd be sleeping on the couch for a month. You know, that would not be a winning bet. But if I invented a, a, a technology that would allow her every time she got in her car to push a button and select the color of her car for the day, that would be an innovation. So creativity, again, is imagining something that just doesn't exist currently, doesn't have to have any utility value, it just is, isn't what, what's there now. And innovation is using creativity to discover something that's useful. That's awesome. No, I love that. I love how you differentiate like the two between, you know, creativity and innovation and also show that interconnection. So Josh, something that I want to take a dive into is, you know, in part one of your book, you write about human creativity, right? And you share about the creative process from, you know, neuroscience, billionaires, as well as researchers across the world. What is the need for creative problem solving and inventive thinking in, in all roles and walks of life? And how could someone inject more purposeful creativity into their daily life? Yeah, excellent question. Um, and I, I love that because that, that to me is what it's all about. You know, it doesn't have to only be, you know, inventing some new drug therapy to be creative. We can be creative in the way that we uh, parent our kids, the way we, like you, take care of your health, the way that you, we um, manage a job, whatever the job might be, or, or even interact with our, our community. And so uh, to me, it's, first of all, recognition that we're all creative as human beings, and we don't have to only follow the path that we've been given. We get to, you know, make some tweaks and adjustments. And so again, when we hear words like innovation, it just feels so overwhelming. Or even creativity, it feels like you have to be composing music or something. But um, creative problem solving or inventive thinking, again, just feels more like something each of us can actually do. And creative problem solving might be um, choosing a different route to work so you can save on your commute time. It might be um, making a sandwich uh, in, in advance of, of, a, of your day so you can save a few, shave a few minutes off of your, of your daily grind. Um, and, and say, so I always think of, of inventive thinking and creative problem solving as two sides of the same coin. Inventive thinking is around seizing an opportunity, like, oh, I want to get a promotion, or I want to land this new client, or I want to, um, I want to deepen my relationship with my, my partner. So those, you know, inventive thinking, it's using the, the spirit of creativity to, to gain something, to, to get, um, to, to, to drive progress. Creative problem solving is, again, same thing, but the opposite side of the coin, which is to, sort of to, to conquer a challenge. So maybe you're, you're facing a problem. Maybe, um, oh, our, our inventory levels are low at work. Or maybe, um, hey, there's a supply chain issue. I'm having a real hard time delivering to my customers. Or maybe it's a personal problem. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with burnout or, or depression. And so it, it's just using the same tool set and create, create a, uh, creativity, but, but to attack a problem instead of seize an opportunity. Thanks for, you know, showcasing like the difference there, the two of them, and also expressing like the need of why it's so important, right? Because I think a lot of listeners who are listening right now, right, like in our daily life, there's always going to be obstacles, there's always going to be challenges, whether you are an entrepreneur, whether you're an athlete, or whether you are, you know, uh, a young professional, right, there's always going to be challenges. So I love how you define like the two of them there. So Josh, something that I know that you had mentioned just earlier on, you know, you believe in small creative ideas that could lead to massive breakthroughs, right? And uh, in your book, you write about the anatomy of an idea. And I love that. Like I was looking at it, checking it out. And, you know, how can someone use this model to think of a small yet big creative idea? Yeah. Well, thanks for, thanks for asking that. Um, often when we think of just the word idea, almost like if you have an idea, it almost feels like there's something final to it. Like that's the idea. And, and when you have an idea, quote unquote, that is ready to be judged and scrutinized. And, and very often when you're in a meeting, for example, you, you might say, hey, I've got an idea. And everybody else in the meeting becomes the idea police. And they tell you all the reasons it won't work and it's not going to fit in the PowerPoint and who's going to fund it. And, and so it's subject to scrutiny. So I think that actually it's a better way to, when you really de de uh, deconstruct an idea, that there's actually different uh, 
atomic parts to it. And so to me, I start with uh, the, no the notion that um, you have inputs, like what, what is, what's inspiring the idea? It could be your body of work, it could be your training, it could be a show you watched on TV last night. But generally, uh, ideas are formed based on inputs. And so sort of think about what are the inputs that will drive an idea forward. Next to me comes sparks. And think of a spark as like a tadpole of an idea. It's not really fully formed yet, but it's the beginning. And I like that because no one's gonna say, oh, I'm gonna shoot down your spark. Because by definition, a spark is just the beginning. It's not ready for scrutiny. And so there, it can be some crazy, like it doesn't have to be you know, perfect. And, and I like it because sometimes it's like the spark that leads to the next spark that leads to the next spark that becomes the idea. And too often we shoot those down prematurely. Then the next thing in my little five-step you know, anatomy is something called an audition where you say, okay, I've just generated 50 different sparks and let's just run a quick filter. Like of the 50, maybe 45 of them are terrible. And that's okay, you know, get rid of them, no harm done. But you're sort of narrowing the field down to a couple possible winning candidates. Then you start to refine those. You might say, okay, I have the three or four left over. You know, what can I tweak or refine or polish to make them really good? You select your best one. And then the last phase is I call a slingshot, which is sort of like, what do you do with the idea? So a terrific idea that sits in the closet is not very helpful. On the other hand, if you take the idea and, and put it into action, put it into motion, um, that's great. And so to me, again, it's just a way to debunk this, this big, scary concept of I got to just invent something and it's perfect upon launch. I mean, when you birth a human baby, it takes 18 plus years for them to be self-sustainable. And so why is it that an idea should be perfect the minute we think of it? And here it's more giving your, your idea a little chance to breathe and, 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 and mature before it's again subject to scrutiny. Thanks for breaking down all of it because, you know, I think a lot of people that are listening, like I was able to connect right away, you know, when I was in charge of organizing this huge conference across Canada, you know, you're first coming out with like the vision, you know, what is it going to look like? What is it going to feel like? And there was a lot of ideas at the start, you know, what is our logo going to look like this and that, right? And there's a lot of brainstorming phase. And I feel like this anatomy of an idea that you have is super applicable that people can do, you know, when it comes to like the brainstorming phase, right? Before it comes to reality. And I love, I love that you connect with the last part of it, of putting it in action, right? The slingshot, right? So I love that. So Josh, in part two of your book, you write about the systematic framework for inventive thinking and creative problem solving. How could someone become an everyday innovator? And are there any stories that you would like to share from creative legends, heroes, or even troublemakers like yourself? <laughs> Yeah, so in, in the book, I cover the eight obsessions of everyday innovators. And think of these as the core mindsets of, of people who, who really want to use innovation to drive better outcomes in their business and their lives. And, um, and, and so I kind of go through a systematic approach of how do the most innovative people, again, think. And, um, you know, they're, they're kind of fun. One, one of them is called start before you're ready. One of them is called break it to fix it. Uh, one of them is called reach for weird. But these are, these are uh, novel approaches. They're sort of the opposite of what most of us have been taught. But it's a good way to reframe our approach to the work because it allows us to, to discover both both small and and big breakthroughs. Um, you know, in, ter in terms of stories, I, I just love stories that aren't about some fancy billionaire. You know, the, those are fell out of reach. But I actually opened the book with a story of a guy named Trellin Resterick, and Trellin T R E W I N. Um, he, he lives in, he lives in central London, and in central London, it turns out that cigarette butt litter is the single biggest environmental challenge that they face. And it's one of those pesky problems. People, people keep trying to throw money at it. Not much success. Well, Trowin, like all of us, realized that he had some dormant creative capacity. He invented something called the ballot bin, which is essentially, it's a, it's, a, it's a bright yellow metal box mounted on a pole at eye level. The front of the box is glass, and there's a divider going down the middle. At the top, so you notice know, you can see into it. At the top, there's a two-part question. Like, which is your favorite food, pizza or hamburgers? And there's little receptacles. So you essentially are voting with your butt, your, your cigarette butt, that is. And you stick your cigarette butt in the receptacle because you can see there's glasses like an instant bar chart as the cigarette butts fall on top of one another. And it's a very simple, low-tech, clever solution. The way it works is that every time the person cleans out the cigarette butts, like every other week, you just insert a new question. So it's always fresh. Anyway, this simple, low-tech solution, which didn't require a billion dollars and any one of us could have invented, it worked. Actually, when ballot bins are installed, they reduce cigarette litter by 80%. Trowin went on and started a company. He's now in 27 countries around the world, making a meaningful impact in this environmental challenge. And so I love, I love stories like that. And that's what the book is filled with. They're stories of everyday people 
becoming everyday innovators. It's not someone who's like 13 PhDs and super wealthy. It's a normal person, but, but they use their creativity to solve an important problem. And to me, it's really inspiring because it shows that any one of us could do the exact same thing. That's beautiful. Thanks for really sharing like that story. And and something too that I really admired, honestly, that you said as well is like, you know, lots of times people always go for like the known stories, right? That seem like unrealistic because like they're so far of how, how they got there, right? Like a billionaire, or, you know, people like that. But I love the fact to you that you have highlighted in your book, you know, the really interesting stories that no one knows about, right? And just like how, you know, everyone starts somewhere. And so I really, really admire that. I really admire that you don't do uh, really much like pedestal talk, you know? Um, so I love that. Thanks for sharing that. So Josh, something that I want to move to is I know you are someone that values habits, routines, rituals. What is one ritual that you do that fuels your creative abilities? Yeah, I've, I've really spent a lot of time thinking about this. And it's so funny, you know, if you think about creativity as something like a, 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 um, a talent, that you either have it or you don't, and there's not much you can do. That kind of sucks. You know, that's not fun. But but the truth is, it's not. It's actually a skill. And a skill, just like learning a language or learning to play tennis, it's a skill that can be developed with practice. And 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 to, for, for those of us that, that never work on a skill, you wouldn't expect to be like a championship level tennis player if you never practiced. So why should we expect that we should be a champion level creator without practice? And to me, just like playing tennis or anything else, there's, there's some simple practice rituals that can really very quickly boost our abilities. Um, I've actually wrote about one in the book that I've even refined a little bit more. And I would recommend anyone listening to try this. It takes two minutes a day, literally two minutes. Here it is. First minute, and I do this every, every morning. The first minute of my uh, two minute practice is I call it guzzling inputs. In, in software engineering, they say, if you want to change the outputs, you got to change the inputs. So what I do is I just sort of bathe in other people's creativity. I might watch a, a band playing a concert on YouTube or maybe I'll stare at a painting or I'll read a poem out loud. Just, just sort of soaking in the creative inspiration of others. The second minute, I call it the unrelated problem. And the unrelated problem is I just try to uh, brainstorm essentially on a problem that has nothing to do with my life. For example, how could I solve traffic, pro uh, traffic congestion in your hometown of Montreal? And so that isn't a personal problem. I have no stake in that. And, and so the goal with that, by the way, is in that second minute is to not come up with one killer silver, silver bullet idea. It's to say, how many little ideas could I come up with in one minute? Uh, maybe we could encourage a commuter lane. Maybe we could reward people for commuting and off times in traffic. Maybe we could um, stagger over the labor force. I mean, on and on. So, so the goal isn't to like just solve it all at once. It's to come up with these little baby ideas that might make a difference. And so what happens for me is I, I take in the creative input of others for one minute. I practice my creativity. It's like creative jumping jacks, basically. It's like going to the gym for your creativity. And literally two minutes a day, if you do that for 30 days in a row, you will notice a massive boost in creative output. Thanks for sharing uh, that ritual. And, you know, those practices, I think mental fitness practices are, are so key, so valuable to people. So I love that. And I also love to how you, you even pick problems that are not yours. You know, we can do that every day, right? I mean, even if we're going for a walk and thinking of things, or if we're going for a coffee, you know, at like a at a business or a restaurant, we could always be thinking like, oh, if we were in their shoes, how would we do this different, right? So I love that. So Josh, there are many creative people out there in this world. We see it more than ever, especially right now with, you know, technology. But my question is, is, you know, there's probably people listening right now, coaches or CEOs or, you know, just everyday people, right? That are listening to this podcast. How do the best innovators go from good to great? You know, how do they make that that kind of leap? Well, a lot of it is, um, first of all, doing the reps. You know, just like, uh, you know, you, you mentioned you, you went for a run this morning. And I bet, you know, if you hadn't ran for, for five years, that first mile would be pretty rough. Because you run all the time, you could probably crank through that first mile while, while talking on the phone. Like you, you, you built up some capacity. So really, a lot of it is doing the reps, which I know it sounds kind of silly, but, but it, it's true. Um, the other thing, though, is like using better technique. And, and I write in the book that most of us, when we want to come up with ideas, we, we brainstorm. But brainstorming is a wildly ineffective and out-of-date out, out technique. It turns out it was invented in 1958. I mean, a lot of things have changed since 1958. Uh, so I actually, in the book, cover, I think there's 13 or so, um, much more fun and much more productive ideation techniques. Um, and, and the problem with brainstorming is when you, when you share an idea in a brainstorm, you're instantly judged. And so fear creeps into the room. And so we tend to share our, our safe ideas, not our crazy ideas. And, and I've developed a bunch of really, again, powerful techniques. Um, but one that I'll just share with you is kind of cool. I call it a uh, role storming, R-O-L-E. Role storming is brainstorming, but in character. 
In other words, you're pretending that you're somebody else. So here's how it would work. Let's say, let's say you and I were doing a normal brainstorm session and, and you are, you come up, you have some really cool idea, but it's not fully baked and you don't want to be laughed at or be judged. So you don't share it. You share, you share only your safe ideas. But now let's say that same brainstorm session is you were, we were role storming. Instead of you being Ben, imagine that you were playing the role of Steve Jobs. Nobody's going to laugh at Steve for coming up with a big idea. I mean, they might laugh at Steve for coming up with a small one. So now you, AKA Steve Jobs, are totally liberated. You can say anything you want, no fear whatsoever. And so the technique is really simple. You work on a real world challenge or opportunity, but each person in the room chooses a character. You could be a superhero. You could be a supermodel. You could be a villain. You could be an inventor. You could be an author. You could be a sports hero. You could be a six-year-old. You could be an alien from the future. But the idea is stay in character during that session and you will be blown away how the creativity flourishes. I love that. And something that I want to just comment on to you is I love to the fact that you brought up putting in like the reps as well as not only putting the reps, but being more deliberate, right? Deliberate practice is so key. And that kind of connects to, I, I know s- stuff that you believe in, in terms of like refining, right? Refining, you know, your, your skill set, your, your product, whatever you are doing, whether you're an athlete, whether you're, you know, a CEO and you're coming up, you know, with this new, you know, product at your business. Right. So I love that. I love, I love everything that you said there. That's great. And then the role playing aspect, I feel like that's like the icing on the cake because I do a lot of journal writing and I have prompts and one, one prompt that I have a lot actually is when I'm in a challenging situation of solving a problem, I'll be like, what would, and then I usually have a blank, what would this person do? And that could be someone that I know who I think I know how they would think in that problem, or it could be someone that I, I listen to, you know, it could be like Steve Jobs, like you were saying. Uh, so I love that. Like the whole role playing idea takes away that fear, that judgment. So I love it. So Josh, something that I want to move to here, the purpose of this podcast is, is to inspire millions of people to achieve greatness and enhance their overall personal well-being. And, you know, on each show I bring on, you know, someone that I think has figured something out and has, you know, valuable wisdom to share. Question I have for you that I ask all my guests is, what is your definition of greatness? Mm. It's a beautiful question. I feel like um, definition of greatness is, of course, an individual thing. Um, but I think you might tie it to to reaching one's full potential. And and so if you know if I have potential to do one thing, you have potential to do something else, it's not the thing that, that defines greatness, it's our ability to actually seize what we're capable of doing. And and if I were to even go one more double click on it, it's it's helping other people achieve their full potential as well. So I think greatness is achieved both in self-mastery and in the elevation of others. That's beautiful. And it reminded me it's very aligned with uh, Kobe Bryant. He had a, a definition which talked about, you know, reaching someone's potential, but most importantly, being that mentor and giving back. Um, and it seems like that's totally aligned with kind of your vision as well. So I don't know if you're a Kobe fan, but um, I love it. So Josh, who is a future guest that you would like to see on this show? Mm. Well, you know, there's so many amazing people out there, but, um, you know, it's hard to even choose one. Uh, but just since you asked the question, um, I'm a huge fan these days of Amanda Gorman. Amanda Gorman, for those that don't know, is a spoken word poet. She spoke at the um, here in the United States, the uh, uh, inauguration for Joe Biden. And um, she's just a, a beautiful soul. Her words just send chills down my spine and talk about someone achieving greatness. Meanwhile, she's like 19 years old or some crazy, you know, it's just remarkable, her artistry. So uh, it's hard to choose one. I could give you a list of hundreds, but one that comes to mind anyway is the uh, is the incredible Amanda Gorman. That's awesome. Well, I, I appreciate you for sharing that name. I will do my best, you know, to try and bring her on one day. And, and when that happens, I'll, I'll be sure to let you know. And uh, Josh, where is the best place for my listeners to connect with you online, to check out all your books, not just your last one, but, you know, check out everything that you're doing. Yeah, thanks so much. Well, the easiest place is just my name, joshlinkner.com, J-O-S-H-L-I-N-K-N-E-R.com. There's links to just about everything I do. Uh, if, if someone's interested, you can also go to biglittlebreakthroughs.com. Uh, it's the title of my most recent book, but there's like a bunch of goodies there. There's like a, an assessment tool and a quick start guide and a bunch of fun tools that people uh, can download. So either of those is a great place to reach me. And I'm on all social media, just at my name at Josh Linkner. Awesome, Josh. Well, I will be sure to put that in the podcast notes. And uh, I want to take this last little bit of time here, Josh, you know, to really thank you for being here. You know, thank you for uh, waking up early this morning getting on a, a, a Zoom call and, and helping produce, you know, this valuable conversation uh, to share your wisdom, your thoughts, your insights. I'm sure all my listeners have really, you know, enjoyed tuning into this. 
Well, thank you. Thanks for doing this, this wonderful podcast and inspiring others. You know, you asked about what's the definition of greatness. To me, it looks like you're you're embracing it fully by by sharing and giving and, and contributing to the world. So uh, keep up the great work and a pleasure being with you today. Thank you for listening to the Living Your Greatness podcast. If this show has added value, please subscribe, leave a rating and make a review.